really relevant to the story I did here. And in the paper, eventually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna write on this. Um, I'll, I'll bring that in too. But here I wanna basically stick with, in some sense, the center of mass frame. Um, Newton uses the center of mass frame or the center of gravity frame in book three of the Principia, um, in some sense, to use it for modeling gravitational interaction, essentially, the, the center of mass frame is the, is the point where the masses are in, burst, uh, in proportion to the, to the speeds of the objects if they were approaching one another. But the guy who developed that view, and, 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 and so Newton put it to, to use himself, the, the, the center of mass or the center of gravity frame, you can use the terms there interchangeably. Although if I recall, the, the, only, the, the only way that the center of mass is identical to the center of gravity is if you're in a uniform gravitational field, then the two, then the two things are synonymous. But um, Newton puts it to use. But where did this come from? And who was the person who popularized it? So, but anyways, we should move along here now. Um, so, as, as to, to give a little, you know, like I said, this will come out as we, we start talking. But as you guys know, and I've been, you've been chatting about this before, right? The difference, uh, my main worries are with respect to the absolute relational debate. So, just to give you a quick little formulation of this, because this will be coming up through the talk the whole time, is that relationism holds that space and time are relations in some sense between. Uh, material objects, and so if there's no material objects, there's no space and time. Whereas the absolutists deny that, right? Space and time have some kind of existence over and above material objects, so you can talk about space and time even in their absence, and they may even, they may even exist in some sense uh, apart from those things. So my long-term project has always been to try to understand this debate. This is kind of been one of the more motivating things in my career, is I've been fascinated by the substance of uh, uh, versus relations in the debate, or absolute versus relations in the debate. How do you come about? What are its properties? Things of that sort. Um, what ways do Newton and Leibniz's respective spatial ontologies differ from the, the modern form of this dichotomy? Uh, has been really been motivating myself, uh, motivating a lot of my past work and current work. Um, and then recently, I've been thinking more and more about this issue: How did the standard dichotomy evolve after Newton and Leibniz? Because the way I see Newton and Leibniz are the, at the end of a tradition. A tradition that bases space and time on God's existence in various ways. Leibniz says that too, just like Newton does. And after these guys, almost nobody talks that way anymore. And so the, the nature of, of the absolute relational debate changes drastically by the mid 18th century. And Kant has a lot to do with that change. Um, and so in this little talk here, I'm going to give, I'm going to talk about uh, relationist themes in the work of Huygens, Carclay, and Kant, and how they influenced the development of the. Of, of the uh, changing nature of the absolute relational debate uh, after about 17, you know, what is it, 1727, if I recall. So by, by the mid-18th century. Um, this is not necessarily to say that Kant was even aware of all the things that Huygens and Barclay did. I mean, I'm not even quite sure of the nature of this. I was talking to Irvin yesterday, and I remember reading this myself, that how much Kant really knew about Barclay is unclear. Uh, but I think it's probably also unclear how much he knew about Huygens. So when I talk here about Kant fitting into a tradition that's related to Huygens and Barclay, really what I'm talking about is his approach to space, time, and motion, and things like this, fits this tradition that these other guys uh, had pioneered before him. He must have been aware of this to some extent, because it's just impossible to read the things that he says in the metaphysical foundations as being disconnected from this. So even if he didn't read it himself, he must have known people who espoused it or talked about it or popularized it. And so maybe, and, and clearly Wolfen and a lot of the Wolfians accept the relational motion. And so it was probably through you know, his early days that he was, uh, uh, became familiar with a lot of that stuff. And so my proposal in the talk is that in contrast to, to the Friedman de Salle line, <laughs> I always seem to be picking on Rob de Salle. I mean, I, I disagree with his view on Newton, and now I disagree with his stuff on Kant. Um, is that um, I think that they overemphasize this Newton Euler lineage. I think it's overplayed drastically, in fact. And that I think you can really see Kant as much closer to this other kind of lineage of thought about space, time, and motion that's connected particularly to Huygens and Leibniz and the Wolfians, and who knows, and maybe even Barclay in some indirect ways as well, because Barclay accepts this stuff. And this is not meant to downplay the importance of Newton. By the way, I should get rid of this thing here. You can't, can't do that. Okay. Yeah. Well, sorry if I'm cutting. I'm going to be cutting off some words then on the bottom, so I'll, I'll read it to you if, if, if that doesn't work. And uh, you guys over here, I don't know if this thing is cutting you off. Can you just see that? Okay. Um, so uh, it is not, not meant to downplay Newton and Euler's work. Obviously, Kant was motivated by their stuff, and Kant in the metaphys essentially the metaphysical foundation of this work from the critical period is an attempt to try to give a Newtonian theory of gravity. With, uh, in, in a kind of a uh, Huygens 
uh, Leibniz Wolfian tradition as I see it. So obviously, in Newton and Euler's work, uh, Euler being one of the ones who helped to perfect Newtonian theory, that Euler was the one who said that you know we don't need absolute position, we don't need absolute speed. All we need is is, is uh, inertial motion and changes from inertial motion. Uh, and then, of course, that did have an effect on on Kant. But did it change totally the nature of his uh, philosophy? You know, I, I do not. I don't think that's uh, plausible. So um, one can trace uh, distinct relations themes in the work of all those guys, right? Oh, I'm sorry, I guess we can see this one. Um, Huygens, uh, Berkeley, and Kant. Uh, what is the, the connection between those three guys, Huygens, Berkeley, and Kant? They all accept the mechanics based on relational motion. Uh, additional things that can be stated is that Berkeley and Kant accept some kind of idealism. This, this is just kind of looking for some kind of commonality between these three. Uh, both Berkeley and Kant accept kind of the notion of idealism, although it's, of course, it's radically different between these two guys, right? Uh, the idealism of Berkeley and the, and the, uh, and the uh, transcendental idealism of Kant, of course, is quite radically different. But uh, there is a similarity in that both of them sort of uh, ground uh, their, their mechanical system on perceptions or what's in our mind to a certain extent in the, in, in the sort of the God-grounded ontology which you get with a Newton or a Leibniz, right? That God's out there upholding space. Of course, that doesn't really play a role uh, either for uh, Berkeley or for Kant. Um, but let's go to Huygens first. So um, Huygens is an interesting guy because um, he's very much like Galileo, right? He, he, I guess you could say he's exactly the same way, that Huygens really has no role for God in his mechanics. So he's, I guess, just the way Galileo did. You know, he's a practical sort of scientist uh, who wants to hold on to observable things uh, and, just, and, and wants results, and mathematical results in particular. Uh, and so, the, as I have heard, the theological foundation of space is not a factor for, for him. That is, Huygens' work seems closer to Galileo. Uh, we were talking about this, I think, in some of the talks, um, in some of the uh, uh, discussions in the workshop over the last couple of days, when we've been talking about Descartes' collision rules. Huygens was one of the first ones to really perfect uh, uh, an approach to nature that uses collision rules. He was inspired by Descartes' collision rules, but very uh, knew that they didn't work very quickly. He realized that the only one that worked was the first one. And he reformulated the first one to apply to all the other cases. And that's the center of mass frame. Within, from the perspective of the center of mass frame, if you're thinking of collisions, ob objects come together and collide and rebound with their initial speeds. The center of mass frame is the perspective from which the speeds are inverse, in, uh, are inverse to, the, to, the, to, the, um, uh, to their sizes. So, so the frame constantly moves as the objects come together and collide. And they can be of any size and rebound the frame will keep moving to hold that position where the speeds are inverse to the sizes as they approach and collide. And Huygens realized that he could use this to, to, to capture the content of all the collision rules and capture them correctly. And it was a great breakthrough. And it had a huge influence on a bunch of other people. A bunch of the other Cartesians and anti-Cartesians picked up on this. This is really one of the great uh, triumphs. And he did all this work <coughs> fairly early. But as we, I think we were talking about it in the workshop, he didn't publish most of this work. He talked about it with friends. Uh, Leibniz came to know of it this way. Eventually, in, uh, through the Royal Society, he had some of it published later in the in the in the in the, uh, in the uh, 16, uh, later 1660s. It started around 1670. Um, some of this stuff was published, but he really sat on it for a long, long time. Um, and I guess he was kind of reluctant. Maybe he was looking for a more comprehensive story to give. But Huygens is, is the real genius who solved the collision problems, and he, and he gave formulations of, the, uh, of pretty much all the conservation laws that we know today. Uh, so, as I have a very particular Huygens proved that the center of mass reference frame provided a way of preserving Descartes' first collision rule and the analysis of motion is reciprocal transfer, the relative motion of two bodies. Uh, this coupling of relative motion to a set of collision rules seems to have been a catalyst for many natural philosophers of the period, not just Newton, to introduce the absolute relational dichotomy, probably even more so than Descartes' own account of bodily motion is reciprocal transfer. Last year at the Hobos, I gave a talk on this aspect of it that uh, Newton was, I uh, think, chairing that session. And so I, I'm really fascinated by some of this stuff because Huygens was really the first fully consistent relationist. He thought that that um, uh, motion was just a relation amongst bodies, and so if you had just one body alone in the world, there's no sense of motion or anything. Uh, motion ha always has to be a relation amongst bodies, and, and, and he was, in many ways, like I said, the first fully. And, and it's just not me who said this. Guys like Ehrman, uh, if you look at. Uh, Jammer's book, Concepts of Space, he argued he makes this point too. Um, he really, uh, I mean, he, he sounds like Julian Barber and some of the other ones who, who uh, are modern relationists in the things that he says. 
And he says that that's how we should think about space and time, the disrelations amongst bodies. However, a lot of his contemporaries took a totally different interpretation of his work. They thought that what the center of mass reference frame showed was that the speeds relative to the center of mass frame may or may not be the true speeds of the bodies. So they took the interpretation that Newton would eventually take in the Principia, that, that there's a difference between relational motion and absolute motion. Relational motion is the motion of bodies uh, relative to one another, especially from the center of mass frame. But that may or may not be the true speeds. And what are the true speeds, the true motions? Those are determined relative to the world or to the absolute space. So you have Borelli writing in 1667. Notice this is long before the Principia. In addition, local motion occurs either from uh, one place of world space to another or in the relative space of some container. The former shall be called real and physical motion, like true motion. The latter we will call relative motion, although oftentimes it does not involve a change of region in the place or the space of the world. Now, we know that Newton was familiar with a lot of this work. So it, it's, 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 I think it's fairly, fairly uncontroversial to say that the absolute relational distinction, uh, absolute motion versus relative motion that you get in the beginning of the Principia, he really took from these guys because they were using this terminology long before he started working on the Principia. And like I said, we know that he knew the work of a lot of these guys. And so here's this other guy, I always like this guy, Nats Pardis. Um, uh, his little tract, um, I think it's an area of uh, discourse of local motion, right? Um, it was really fun. And he says, I call absolute velocity, which is considered in a body compared with the space wherein it moveth, and respective or relative, that which is considered in two bodies compared together, by which velocity these two bodies mutually approach or recede from. So here's Pardis using the same distinction. There's a distinction between absolute motion, which is relative to the world, or to some kind of absolute conception of space, and relative motion is different. And Pardis goes on in particular to, to, to make the criticism that just shows that Descartes was wrong. Pardis criticized the Cartesian. And by the way, this work is 1670, you know, once again, 17, 16, 17 years before the Principia comes out. Pardis criticized the Cartesian conservation law by pointing motion, size, time, speed, to conserve an impact by claiming, tis not true there is always as much absolute motion after the percussion as there was before, but tis easy to demonstrate that the respective motion is always the same, so that the bodies receive one another after the percussion as fast as they approached before it. This clearly shows that he's thinking in terms of the center of mass frame. You know? And so, this, like I said, this stuff is really mind-boggling to me because this is stuff that many people who work on, on the absolute relational debate have no awareness of, that there were all these other people that were using the distinction that has become familiar and been seen as invented by Newton, but of course you couldn't have invented it because these guys were using the distinction on the form. Huygens was ticked off by all this. <laughs> he, he said that, you know, you're getting it wrong. You're taking my results and reading it the wrong way. And, if you and this codex there, I'm using the translation by my friend Marius, who, did, has, uh, who's, um, who uh, has, has translated all this collection of, of statements. Once again, none of this stuff was published in his lifetime, uh, although he did share his ideas with Leibniz and many others. But he had all these comments about, uh, about this stuff. And he goes, I claim that motion, uh, and so, Make a long story short, let's, let's talk about Huygens' own particular work. Um, he wants to argue that right, motion is, is a relation amongst bodies. I claim that motion is nothing unless in relation to other bodies. Without any offense to God, we shall say that he cannot make it thus that there is a relation to something that does not exist, i.e., that a body needs several bodies. Similarly, I maintain that God also cannot create a single body at rest. For rest, just as motion is relative to something else. So this is um, this is so modern. Right? I mean, if you only have one body, there's the very concept of motion is inapplicable because motion is a relation, right? uh, and neither can be predicated with a single body. So that's the litmus test for a relationist, right? Um, if you have a single body alone in the world, can it move? If the answer is yes, then you're not a true relationist, or at least a, at least a, a fully consistent relationist. You have a, some kind of variation on relationism. Maybe you're a modal relationist, the way they talk these days, or the way the, as the concept came to be developed in the 20th century. Um, and so here's later on, or another aspect of the codex. Uh, absolutes accept that absolute place is truly a move. We who follow Copernicus' position will say that perhaps the fixed stars in the center of the sun uh, that are truly at rest. Uh, notice there's a little inference to mock, maybe a little, a little comparison with mock there. Now they are at any rate relatively at rest, each one relative to the other, but since they are placed in the space of the world infinitely extended on all sides, then with respect to what body or with what other thing are they all together at rest? With respect to the unmoved space of the world, they will reply. Those are the people who accept you know, some kind of absolute space. Um, thus, the entire question turns on this point, namely, if the infinitely extended space of the world is unmoved. To me, however, this seems to be a false notion. 
right? So, you know, everything's, well, I mean, you can talk about motions being relative to the fixed stars, but then the question of the, of the motion of the fixed stars would come up as well. And so basically he's saying, you know, that, that, you know, you can't jump from the fixed stars to absolute space. Um, you only have to talk about it with respect to something. You can talk about motion with respect to the fixed stars, but, but you know, those can have motions themselves too, you know, um, potentially. And so there's, there's no way, I guess, you could identify absolute place. You can only identify with respect to other bodies, regardless of what those are. So uh, Voigtens concludes that motion and rest can only be determined with respect to other bodies, so the state of motion determines the world cannot be determined, and that's modern relationism. Once again, God does not appear to play any role in, in the details of Voigtens' system, so he follows in Galileo's footsteps. So I talked about this. I should get moving along here. But uh, switch to Barclay. This is kind of a radical jump. Um, but part of the reason I want to bring in Barclay is because this shows you that even amongst the empiricists, uh, the kind of view that Huygens is promoting is accepted. Um, once again, I'm not quite sure how, how much Barclay is even aware of Huygens' work. He must have been to a certain extent, I would think, because what he says is almost identical to what Huygens says in, uh, in The Principles of Human Knowledge. This work comes out in 1710, 1713, the specific date. Um, and so Barclay says, and this is like I said, this uh, human Huygens would get along perfectly, I think. I must confess it does not appear to me that there could be any motion other than relative, so that to conceive motion there must be at least conceived two bodies, where the distance or position uh, in regard to each other is varied. And so if there was only one body in being, it could not possibly be moved. So he, he, he passes the litmus test of relations as well. This seems evident in that the idea I have of motion doth necessarily include a relation. Um, and his, uh, of course, his, his relationism follows from his idealism. He has a totally, totally different setup than Huygens. Right? Huygens is a scientist. He wouldn't have any patience for the kind of silly idealism that Barclay has. But they join together in the results of their views, right? Uh, and so uh, PHK is the principle of human knowledge again. When we attempt to abstract extension and motion from all other qualities and consider them by themselves, we presently lose sight of them and run into great extravagances. All sensible qualities are like sensations and the like real, that where the extension is there is the color too, i.e. in his mind, and that these, uh, their archetypes can exist only in some other mind, none of which can be supposed to exist unperceived. So the basis of his relationism is his conception of the world, which is that everything that exists is a perception. And so nothing but perceptions exist, and so he seems to think that therefore motion is a, is a relation of these, uh, of these perceptual states and therefore, right, um, to talk about motion outside of perception seems, doesn't seem to work. And that's sort of what drives his relationism. Uh, Barclay's idealism undermines absolute motion and absolute space. So here's come some of the other things later in the principles where he shoots down absolutism. He's, he's, he's uh, aware, right, obviously, of, of Newton and the absolutists in, in his day, and in particular in England, of course, and in the UK. I believe we may find all the absolute motion we can frame an idea of to be bo at bottom no other than relative motion thus defined. And then he says there, from what has been said, it follows that the philosophic consideration of motion does not imply the being of an absolute space distinct from that which is perceived by sensory related bodies, which it, uh, that it cannot exist without the mind is clear upon the same principles that demonstrate the life of all other objects of sense. So this is kind of nice because he's basically saying, part of the reason I reject absolute space is because of my of the way I conceive the world, which is you know everything is is is, is uh, perceived by sense and related by bodies, and you can't and they couldn't exist without the mind. So he's giving sort of like an idealist <laughs> rejection of absolute space in a weird way. Um, Turning Kant finally, um, in the pre-critical period, right? Uh, pre-critical period starts with the true estimate of living forces, his very first work, which puts forward his monadological hypothesis. Kant was heavily steeped in Leibnizian, Wolfian philosophy for, I think, for his whole career, but clearly up to the regions of space in 1768, he was in that, in that tradition. So during those years, he puts forward a monadic conception of the world that follows in the, in the Leibniz world school, where force is the basis of all material phenomena. And he has a conception just like Leibniz that we were talking about this morning, that force is the basis of everything. And it, and it comes up from his monads. And his, his approach to it, though, is much more consistent than Leibniz's. It's a really beautiful, logical story. I'll talk about that next week in the other talk. Uh, although he rejected any kind of idealist, phenomenalist kind of worldview that you would get at Barclay at this point. He really thinks there's a, unlike Leibniz, where there's always been this debate about whether Leibniz is really kind of a phenomenalist in the Barclay sense, right? Uh, Kant had no interest in that stuff during the critical 
he really believes there's a world outside of there, outside of our minds, and that that world is a force, force world. Of course, I think Leibniz thinks that too, and, and so do a bunch of other scholars like Rick Arthur and Rutherford and, and, uh, and Dan Garber. Um, but um, anyways, skip, talk about that later. Uh, so, but from the late 1660s, he starts criticizing the Leibniz Wolfian tradition, and he starts criticizing their conception of relationism. Or so it seems. I think he's criticizing us, and this will come up next week more so. His criticisms of relationism come from one of the ways he thinks that relationism is justified. Namely, he seems to think that the relationists are deriving space from an empirical abstraction from bodies, and that can't work, he argues. And like I said, that's a different story. We won't talk about that today. But he has a particular reason for criticizing it. Um, but like I said, we'll talk about that later. So now, now let's get to the critical period, um, and, uh, and let's talk about the metaphysical foundations. This is his mature work. This is his uh, of natural philosophy during the critical period. This is the work where he's going to present his own sort of interpretation of Newtonian theory. Lo and behold, it's extremely Wigensian and Leibnizian and Barclay. Uh, did Newton's work prompt the transition from Kant's critical period to, uh, uh, well, yeah, to Kant's critical period, or Newton and Euler's criticisms of relational motion? How important is the role of Newtonian science in general to Kant? Friedman's great work that just came out a few years ago, it's just a wonderful work. It's just this, this <laughs> telephone book-sized investigation of the metaphysical foundations, and it's really thorough. But Mike Friedman has always been a little bit of the Newtonian side of this picture here. And so, as he says here in the very preface, my reading of Kant's treatise is Newtonian, and so far as I place Newton, uh, Newton's Principia at the very center of Kant's argument. He's, and it's, it's interesting when you read this because in the course of writing this book, I haven't actually talked to Friedman about this. I remember him telling me about it you know, three or four years ago, maybe five years ago or so. Um, I think he's been pushed by Marius and by Eric Watkins and stuff to, to, to I think he's back, but I find in the work a lot of defensiveness, <laughs> actually. I think he's realizing that, that his, his, his super Newtonian interpretation, at least in his earlier years, isn't, up, isn't being upheld. Right, because, as I was saying, there's a lot of things um, that we see as Newtonian, which the Leibnizians accepted as well, like the action-reaction principle. And unfortunately, this morning, we were looking at the specimen dynamicum. We didn't talk about the action-reaction principle, which is, 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 uh, is really front and center in that work, um, where, where Leibniz has a view that everything that, uh, that acts reacts to, and that the reciprocity of transfer of bodies is matched by a reciprocity of action and reaction. And, and, and the Wolfians picked up and developed that at length. And, and, and Kant seems to be approaching that. In fact, Marius had an article that came out a couple of years ago saying that this notion that, that Kant is motivated by Newton's third law of motion. Newton's third law of motion is the same thing, like for every action is an equal and opposite reaction. That Marius says that that's not from the Principia, that's from the Leibniz Wolf tradition. And, and so Friedman basically says that the, mo his, the motivation for his um, putting Newton at the center of Kant's argument is because uh, he, uh, Newton is, Newton's name is mentioned more than anybody else's in the metaphysical foundations, and because his formulation of the cosmological system uh, is an attempt to recapture uh, Book Three of the Principia, and so that's why he sees it, and that, that's you know, that's plausible, but it's very hedged, and and, and that's a plausible interpretation. Um, turning to Rob's work, Rob in his 2006 book takes a very different tack. Um, he really thinks that it's the Principia and Newton's work in general that had led to the critical period, that it really changed the fundamental nature of Kant's philosophy from the pre-critical period to the critical period. And so you get these things that he says in his book. Kant's mature concern was not to establish one of two opposing medical, metaphysical positions, and, and it's implied in the earlier stuff when he's talking about absolutism versus relationism. But to demonstrate that the metaphysical concepts that occur in physics, body, force, motion, space, and time become intelligible to us precisely and only as they are constructed by physics itself. Physics provides us with the only intelligible notions we have of these matters. Therefore, the metaphysical concepts underlying the sensible world first become intelligible for Kant in the framework of Newtonian physics. So for Rock, he really sees that Newton's physics really sort of like changed the very trajectory of Kant's thinking about everything. Really, even about how metaphysics is done. I mean, that is such a bold claim. And so you have up there, Kant's analysis of absolute space accordingly is an effort to clarify its place within the system of Newtonian principles. But now this is the point of the whole presentation here. And, and I'll, you know, what you guys can see 
whether you agree, agree with me or not. Um, there's two ways to approach, I think, the influence of Newton on Kant. Uh, Newton's, Newtonian physics is obviously central to the metaphysical foundations. There's no question of that. But is it one due to the fact that by the time that Kant's writing in the 1780s, Descartes' theory has long been banished, and almost nobody's holding onto the vortex theory by the 1780s anymore? Is it because the established status of Newtonian theory by that time, right? And so if you're going to do a system of natural philosophy, you have to accommodate Newton because he's one, essentially? Or is it that for Kant, Newtonian physics is in itself a philosophical critique of metaphysics as, as traditionally practiced? I mean, that's really Rob's really strong point, that Newtonian physics really changed the way he thought about the world. Uh, is it one or two? Is it just that by the 1780s, Newton is so successful, his, his system of, of science, his system of mechanics, the, the theory of gravitation is so successful that any uh, Leibnizian Wolfian still around has to try to give, uh, uh, try to recapture Newtonian theory or capture the good things about Newtonian theory. Uh, and, uh, and, and therefore, you have to you have to reconcile yourself with Newtonianism, or is it really because Newtonian physics really changed the whole conception of how to do philosophy in general? I, I don't think two is plausible in any way, shape, or form. Quite frankly, I mean, just, it's just there's no evidence for it, as, as we'll see as we go along. So my proposal is on the basis of the evidence from the text, many not many non-Newtonian features in Kant's theory, and the fact that much of the pre-critical conception of motion is retained in the critical period. Uh, option one is the more plausible interpretation that is Kant remained loyal to the Leibniz Wolfian tradition and in fact tried to assimilate Newtonian theory to that tradition. Maybe that's maybe that's uh, not that uh, uh, is is is, uh, is uh, groundbreaking because I'm, I'm making it out. Um, part of the reason for this is because Kant was consistently a relationist throughout his whole career, and, and this is a fact about Kant that very few people know. In fact, even I think even most Kant scholars probably don't know this, although it's been written about extensively. There's been a lot of work. Uh, Marius had a paper on this recently. Uh, Carrier had a really nice article. In fact, Carrier's article is something like uh, Kant's Relations Conception of Absolute Space, because the actual name of the title. And uh, Burroker has written on this. There is a whole s section of scholars who have been writing about this, about, about the relationist uh, uh, approach that Kant uh, really pretty much adopted throughout his whole work. One of those pre critical works I was talking about earlier is this new doctrine of motion and rest. And in that work, Kant puts forward the same kind of, limited it was just a, a particular form of relationism. It's from the paper. It's basically the idea that there's nothing other than the relations amongst bodies. Uh, he puts forward the center of mass frame that I was mentioning about with Huygens, alongside the same relationist conception of place and motion that you find in Huygens and Barclay. Before introducing his impact model in that work, he says, I, I argue that the place of a thing is known by its position, situation, and by its external relationship to other objects around it which he dubs a relative space, and he insists that the terms motion and rest should never be used in an absolute sense, but always relatively. So in that work, he, 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 he basically is kind of mimicking Huygens and Barclay in, in his conception of motion. And he uses the center of mass reference frame for collisions. Jumping into the metaphysical foundations now, um, you get the same story. Uh, all motion that is an object of experience is merely relative in the space in which it is perceived as a relative space, which itself moves in terms of an enlarged space. To assume an absolute space that is one such that because it is not material, it can also, uh, it can also not be an object of experience, that you can kind of get into the critical period of thinking there, as given in itself, is to assume something which can be perceived neither in itself nor in its consequences, motion in absolute space. Part of the thing um, that uh, um, Kant does in the Metaphysical Foundation, which is really cool, is he thinks that there's always a frame, a material sort of frame or material conception of motion, and that um, there could, and he's thinking largely in terms of cosmological processes, and he thinks that any space, which is a relative space, is going to be part of a bigger relative space, and you can keep extending this on and on and on for the entire material infinite world. But every space that you can conceive of, uh, because you can only, because space has to be constructed right from the, because at this point, of course, he's got the, uh, the, the uh, intuitions of space and time, right, the forms of the intuition of space and time. And so, you know, he's in the critical period, right, of course, it's very empirically based, or, or I should say, uh, idealist, transcendentally idealistic based, right? So, absolute space cannot be something you can, you can have a perception of. It's not something that you can have, uh, you can have uh, an intuition of. And so, there's a sense in which if you're going to talk about space, you always have to talk about a relative space, because that's the only thing you could ever have an experience of. 
Um, absolute space there is therefore necessary, not as a kind of, and this, by the way, you know, obviously the metaphysical foundations of using the, uh, the, the standard uh, uh, patronation there. Absolute space is therefore necessary not as a concept of an actual object, but rather as an idea, which is to serve as a rule for considering all motion therein merely as relative, and all motion at rest must be reduced to absolute space, if the appearance there is to be transformed into a determinate concept of experience, which unites all, all appearances. So he uses the term absolute space, but that's just the term. It's just absolute space is an idea for, in some sense, constructing our empirical world. And so Kant's kind of doing a little slide of hand here, right? He's talking of, he, he's using the terminology of absolute space, but he's clear that he really means a relative space. It's, it, it's a, in fact, he thinks of absolute space as a construction process by which we keep constructing these bigger and bigger relative spaces. I mean, it's really, it's, it's a unique approach, but you can see that, like I said, it's a little underhanded because he's, because I mean, when people see the word absolute space, they have built in uh, sort of intuition about what it means, and he's using it in a different way. So he says a little bit later, in all experience, something must be sensed. So this is kind of following up on the last point. And that, uh, and that is the real or of sensible intuition. And therefore, the space in which we are to arrange our experience of motion must also be sensible. That is, it must be designated through what can be sensed. And this is the totality of all objects of experience. In itself, an object of experience is called empirical space. But this, as, as material, is itself movable. But a movable space, if, it, if its motion is to be capable of being perceived, presupposes it can turn into a large material space in which it is movable, and so on to infinity. So there, there's the quote, you know, backing up the little story I was telling you about earlier. Moving along, uh, one of Kant's main objectives in the, in, the, in the mathematical foundations is to supply his own interpretation of Newtonian gravitation theory, as I was mentioning earlier, a process that concludes by considering the cosmos as a whole, together with the common center of gravity of all matter, is the ultimate relative space for correctly determining all true motion and rests. Uh, Friedman's uh, preface to the Metaphysical Foundations from 2004, right? So as he, and, and, and Kant uses this term, the common center of gravity of all matter, right? Because that's what Kant is kind of going for. In the, in the, uh, in the limit uh, of, uh, as we approach infinity, right? As these relative spaces keep getting larger and larger in the limit as we go on to infinity, the ultimate relative space would be the common center of gravity of all matter. And of course, there's your connection to Mach, right? Because that's exactly what Mach argues there. Um, that, that we replace absolute space with the center of mass of the universe. Um, one of the novel features of Kant's system is that, and now the thing that's interesting here, and this is what I really think is ingenious, and this is like in some sense, the fully blown, this is like Huygens would be proud of him, I think, <laughs> because he, you know, we were talking about the center of mass frame as the, as the frame in which objects collide and rebound. Um, and of course, Newton had used the center of mass frame for understanding gravity. And so essentially, Kant takes the center of mass collision frame and the center of mass frame for understanding the motions of the planets, and he combines them. And he, and he, and he sees them as two sides of the same coin. And it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a, uh, it's kind of like a synthesis of, of Newton's uh, version uh, or exploitation of the center of mass frame and Huygens. So one of the novel features of Kant's system is that it envisions that the center of gravity approach as an instance of a larger strategy for interpreting all bodily interactions that also includes within its scope the center of mass frame cl collision model that we talked about earlier. As regards impact, Kant provides an example involving two bodies, A and B, that approach from opposite directions along the same rectilinear path. So this is um, this is recapturing some of the stuff he said in the uh, in the new uh, the new uh, So um, maybe we don't need to go through all of this, but this is his, um, his uh, discussion of the center of mass collision frame and the metaphysical foundations. Uh, the change of relation of thus the motion between bodies is completely mutual. As much as one body approaches every part of the other, uh, by so much does the other approach every part of the first. On this basis, the motion of the body A with respect to another body B at rest, in regard to which it can, there, uh, can thereby be moving is reduced to absolute space. That is, as a relation of acting causes merely related to one another, uh, remember, he's using absolute space here as, as, as a construction process for relative spaces. And the only way this can happen is that the speed ascribed to the relative space uh, to body A alone is a portion between an inverse ratio to their masses, right? That's, that's, that's how you find the center of mass. So, Besides the replacement of absolute space with material-based reference frame, the relations inherent in Kant's metaphysical foundations appears in the following way. So I'm going to elaborate some of the ways that relationism appears in this, in this system. 
Uh, one, the individual states of motion assigned to the bodies are perspectival, but the invariance of the relative change in distance among the bodies is emphasized, right? This is stuff that, that Huygens uh, discovered in the center of mass frame, Leibniz put at the center of the specimen dynamic. All relation, all motion of material things counts as merely relative with respect to one another, as alternatively mutual, but not as absolute motion or rest. Essentially, the idea being in the center of mass frame, right, um, uh, if, if, as they come and collide together, if, if you're just considering them as the motion coming together, right, the, the, the thing that's fascinating about this, in fact, guys like Barber said this is, you know, Huygens discovered it was like the first transformation rule, right? Whether you see this guy is moving, this guy at rest, or this guy at rest and this guy moving, the equations, like, that are captured in, in, in the center of mass frame, like mv squared, are always the same. So you can divvy up the speeds, you can assign the speeds in various ways, but as long as they come together and collide and rebound in speeds inverse to their, to their masses, right, regardless of the individual states of motion that you ascribe to them, you'll always uphold the same equation, right? And, and Kant's very familiar with that. And, and, and so, in other words, you don't, and so there's no absolute states of motion of the bodies. The, the states are purely relative and they can be ar arbitrarily uh, uh, assigned just as long as the, as the inverse, uh, the speed controls the inverse of their masses. And so that's relationism, because in other words, there's no individual states of motion, right, of their own. Uh, two, Kant converts one of Newton's empirical arguments for absolute space via the rotating globe's thought experiment in Principia into a form that allegedly, he thinks, upholds relational motion among the material parts of the rotating system. So one of Kant's criti uh, uh, one of um, Newton's criticisms, we'll, we'll be talking about this tomorrow morning, is, of course, against the relational motion, is the rotating bucket experiment, right? As the bucket rotates, the water eventually goes up to the side of the bucket, but as Newton argues in the in the in the uh, Principia, right, the 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 existence of the non uh, inertial forces, the force of the water going up the bucket, these acceleration forces, are not correlated with the relational motion of the water in the bucket. There's times where the water and the bucket are moving relative to one another, but the water's flat, and there's times when the water and the bucket are moving simultaneously together, and the water's curved. And so the existence of these of this accelerated effects don't correlate with the, with the relational motion between the water and the bucket. This is still to this day one of the, one of the things that, that has, has been the nail in the coffin or the, one of the worst, you know, sort of one of the most fundamental problems with relationism, right? It's never really been able to resolve this problem. And so Newton clearly uh, uh, came up with one of the great criticisms of relational motion. Kant is aware of this, of course, and he tries to give a way to get out of this basically by, in some sense, talking about the motion of the parts of the body relative to one another. Of course, Huygens and, and there's another reason why I've, conjo I've conjoined Huygens and Barclay and Linus together, is because all those guys were worried about the same problem too, and they all gave a formulation to try to get out of this problem that's very similar to Kant's. Circular motion, although it is in fact exhibits no change of place in the appearance, exhibits nonetheless a continuous dynamical change demonstrable through experience, uh, in the relations of matter within its relative space, for example, a continual diminu uh, diminution of attraction and virtue striving to escape. So one of the things that's interesting here, actually, the, the part of how it comes up in the next slide, Kant thinks that, that this is okay to talk about, about these non-inertial forces of rotation because I can separate out, uh, uh, say, the, the case of the bucket being still and the case of the bucket rotating due to the observable force effects. And so because the observable force effects are observable, that's, that, that will give you a reason for, in some sense, saying that the one really is rotating and the other one isn't. So he basically turns Newton's argument on its head and basically says, this actually upholds my conception because there, an experience will tell you whether the, the bucket's rotating or not. Maybe you'll see the, you'll see the centrifugal force. Here's, here's actually the, the quote I wanted. But he says that that doesn't violate relationism for this reason. This motion, even though it is no change in relation to particle space, nevertheless not absolute motion, but rather a continuous change in the relations of matter to one another, which although represented in absolute space, is thus actually only relative, and for just that reason is true, is true motion. Uh, this rests on the representation of the mutual and continuous withdrawal of any part of the Earth outside the axis from any other part lying dot diametrically opposite to it at the same distance from the center. So essentially his argument is, this doesn't violate relationism, because when I talk about an object rotating around and showing non-inertial forces, it's not moving with respect to absolute space, it's moving with respect to another object on the opposite side of the rotational thing there. So in other words, the object is, is, is showing the dynamical sort of effects of the rotation, not with respect to absolute space, but with respect to another body, 
And so therefore, it doesn't violate relationism. And that's exactly the kind of strategy that Barclay actually tried to use, although it really, it really comes out convoluted in the in, in Demotu. And Huygens was trying to do something like that too. All of those guys there that I mentioned, uh, Barclay, Huygens, Kant, and Leibniz, are really bothered by rotation. They, they know that this is a potential serious problem for relational motion. And they all try to get around it by, by in some sense, trying to remodel the, the, uh, the phenomena as purely still relational motion. So they all are all bonded by, by this attempt to resolve the rotation problem by seeing it as a rotation of bodies relative to one another rather than as relative to absolute space, as Newton had argued had to be the case. So that's another thing that really links those guys together. Uh, Kant rejects as utterly impossible a scenario where an entire cosmos moves uniformly and rectilinearly through space, what, comes, what is known now in the, in the modern terminology as a kinematic shift argument. Right, I mean, and this is basically, you guys know from the Leibniz Clark correspondence, this is one of the things that, that Leibniz tries to tease Clark with about, you know, you know, could the whole material world be moving uniformly through absolute space? Leibniz thinks that's silly. But Clark bites the bullet and says, well, of course, I guess it could. Why not? And, and that's seen as an embarrassment for the, for the Newtonians. But Kant wants to reject that as an impossible scenario. Why? Because he's a relationist. The very notion of the whole motion of the universe would be like talking about the motion of a single body alone, which he rejects. So, uh, and so he rejects that as an utterly impossible scenario that the whole universe could be moving uniformly because that violates relationism. And likewise denies a potential cosmic rotation, but concedes that it is always possible to think about a rotation this way. There's a whole long story on this, but I, I, I'm not, not going to get into it because um, it brings all kinds of other uh, 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 technical stuff that, and it's a whole different story that Kant tries to give to get out of the rotation of the universe. Um, but he, he does say that it would be of no conceivable use. But he does say, too, by the way, that absolute motion, thought without any relation of matter to another, is completely impossible. You know, he says that, that there, there's his upholding um, the litmus test for relationism in the metaphysical foundations. So, um, getting here towards the end. These relationist aspects of Kant's system in the mathematical foundations, oops, I kept on there, raise severe problems for de Salle's claim. And this, and so this is my, my, my take on it. All of these incredibly relationist aspects of the metaphysical foundations, I think, raise insurmountable obstacles for the claims that de Salle has made. One of those claims being that Kant's mature concern was not to establish one of two opposing metaphysical positions, absolutism or relationism. That is just hard to buy. <laughs> he clearly is defending relationism, right? And in a relational conception, even of Newtonian physics. Uh, but rather that the goal of the metaphysical foundations is to demonstrate that the metaphysical concepts that occur in physics, body, force, motion, space, and time become intelligible to us only, uh, precisely and only, as they are constructed by Newtonian physics itself. Physics provides us with the only intelligible notions we have of these matters. Bunk, you know, that's just not the case. I'm sorry. You know, if you're going to say that he's trying to remain consistent in Newtonian physics, that just doesn't work for, for some of these reasons. Uh, as I argue, the evidence indicates that the non-Newtonian principles uh, played at least uh, a stronger role as Newton's did with his rejection of the uniform inertial motion of the material world presenting the most conspicuous, conspicuous example. This is now, I think this argument that was really clever, and Friedman really likes this one too. I mean, it's really a fun argument. Essentially, his idea is, and here's why I actually talk about the action reaction principle. Kant's third law of mechanics, as he calls it, is the action-reaction principle. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Like I said, for the longest time, a lot of the, the Newton sort of inspired people saw this as Kant's uh, uh, um, reconciling Newton's third law to his own system. But Marius and Eric and all those guys have showed that all these principles are, are in play in the Wolfians and, of course, in Kant's own earlier work in the pre-critical pre period. Uh, but this is how Kant gets out, tries to resolve the problem of a uniform motion of the entire world. Essentially, he says it violates the third law of mechanics because it would essentially be an action without a reaction. It would be a motion without some sort of opposite motion. So if a body were looked, and, and, and he basically says if there, if there were a body were located outside the cosmos, Kant reasons that the mutual gravitational interaction between the cosmos and the world would, this is the only way, in fact, that the whole world could, could, could move uniformly is if it was in a gravitational attraction with another object. So, so he says um, that this is the only scenario that would allow you, us to talk about a uniform motion of the world, is if there was another body out there and they gravitated and, and there was gravitational attraction between them. That would cause the universe to move in unison. Of course, I guess it's not all the universe, it's all the universe minus this one body over here. 
but the, all the rest of the cosmos would be moved uniformly relative to the other body. But then notice what Khan says. Uh, the shift, uh, the, this, uh, this, the mutual gravitation between the universe and this single lone body way out there alone on itself would shift the common center of gravity of all matter and thus the entire cosmic system from its place. But then he says, but then the motion would be relative. So all motion has to be relative. So he uses the action-reaction principle to forestall, in some sense, a uniform inertial motion. But this is essentially changing the whole foundation of Newtonian physics. Because this is basically saying that uh, a uniform, as I have up here, this would be saying that, um, or I guess you should just follow that road so I can say it differently. Yeah, by stipulating the side of the Newtonian concept of inertia, and Kant does use inertia in many of his explanations that all bodies have a tendency to want to move inertially. Uh, and, and so he's, a, he's got, so Kant's got attention there, right? How can you use inertial motion to understand, in some sense, uh, um, gravitational attraction and gravitational forces, but then deny, and so he, it's like Kant's saying, you can use inertial motion to model a single body, but it can't apply to all bodies. You know, so, so inertial motion, essentially, you know, that objects want to keep moving uniformly in a certain direction, can only apply to one body alone, but it can't apply to all of them. Um, and so as I put it, to put it in specifically in Newtonian terms, the problem with Kant's reasoning is that this is tantamount to claiming that the world's inertial motion, which comes under Newton's first law, would violate the third law. It's as if the third law trumps the first law. I mean, this is not, in some sense, as, as Rob says, I don't know what, exactly what is his claim, right? His claim is, uh, that metaphysical concepts that occur in physics, body force, motion, space, and time, become intelligible to us precisely and only as they are constructed in Newtonian physics. Well, if you're saying that the third law trumps the first law, you're rewriting Newtonian physics. You're not following it precisely. You're changing the whole structure of Newtonian science. And so I just, you know, I just don't think that that claim could be upheld in any way, shape, or form. So Kant's maneuver essentially constitutes a fundamental reconstruction of Newtonian physics, a, re a, re a revaluation of basic principles that just so happens to be in line with a Huygens' conception of relationism. Right? So conclusion, accordingly, while Newtonian uh, thinking and, and Newtonian science undoubtedly played a significant role in Kant's mature natural philosophy, perhaps it would be better, it would be more accurate to infer that for Kant, the metaphysical concepts underlying the sensible world first become intelligible, this is kind of like little writ here. Uh, uh, first become intelligible in the framework of Huygens, Leibniz, Wolfian physics rather than Newtonian physics. And, I, I, and when I showed it to Marius, he got a kick out of that. Um, anyways, likewise, it's rather difficult to avoid the conclusion that one of the chief goals of the metaphysical foundations is to provide an anti-absolutist interpretation of Newtonian physics that follows the relations precedent set by such earlier thinkers as Huygens and Berkeley, as well as Kant's own earlier new doctrine. Uh, if Kant's system is examined against the backdrop of the absolutist Newtonian Euler conception versus the relation of Huygens, Leibniz, and potentially Barclay Wolfian conception, as I see it, his natural philosophy clearly favors this latter tradition. So the idea being, right, obviously Newton had an influence on Kant, but what lineage of thought about space and time do we put Kant? I think it's clearly here and not there. The end. <laughs> So uh, thank you very, very much. It was very, very interesting. Thank you. If, if you. Even though I'm not sure on every point that is said. So I agree with you on this critique of Gisal. I think he overrates uh, um, uh, the meaning of Newton, especially for the critical turn. Right. Um, but I see, um, so you said that uh, Kant was one of the first guys who took uh, the question of God out of the question of natural philosophy. And that's to some degree true. So um, what I, the person I see crucial in this is Euler, because Euler in his, uh, in his writings, in his letters to a German princess, in, in this passage where he says, um, you know, um, when we talk about space, um, um, even the Bible says that, of course, God can act everywhere, but he is not everywhere. Right. And, and um, for that reason, um, Cassila says that Euler is someone who declares the independence of natural, uh, of natural science, that he's the first mm -hmm. one who is, not, um, um, who is not trying to build natural science on theological ideas, even though Euler is a very religious person. Mm -hmm. And what I, what I don't agree on is, you said that, that, that Kant, even in the beginning, is a Leibnizian. I don't think it's that way. Like, um, like um, Alois Real says that, of course, he is in these debates, in these Leibnizian, Wolfian debates of that time. 
but even in his first writing, there is a huge difference between his idea of space and the idea that, that, um, that Leibniz has. Leibniz says um, space is the coexistence of bodies, mm -hmm. while, um, Newton, uh, while, while Kant says coexistence is not enough alone. We also need a kind of, uh, a kind of how do you call it, uh, a kind of uh, <laughs> a kind of connection between them, yeah, a kind of connection. Yeah. And this connection is gravity. It's Newtonian gravity. Right. So what he's trying to do, and it's something that Friedman stresses, is um, he tries to combine Newtonian physics with uh, Leibnizian and maybe later critical metaphysics. And this type of synthesis is, to my, to, is what I believe more what Kant has in mind. It's not so much about, about Leibniz. It, it's a kind of synthesis between these both uh, thinkers that both stick to totally different paradigms. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, so he's not a Leibnizian, he's more like something like uh, in between, between them both. Um, and um, one interesting question that I ask myself all the time when I read the, the last chapter of the, the Metaphysical Foundations of Natural Science is how far you think he can solve the problem of the bucket experiment. Because to my point of view, I think he's in some way needs something to explain. If he wants to explain why is the, the, water, um, uh, um, uh, the water inside the vessel, why it is moving up, uh, up uh, the sides, he needs to introduce something like an absolute reference frame or something like that. In, the, in some way he seems, he says, yes, I can show that it moves because of the dynamic effect. Of course, that's something that Newton would say, that's true. But can you, but can you give a cause? Can you give, a, um, can you give us a reason why, uh, let's say in an empty universe, you have just a bucket with water in it. Can you give us a reason why in one universe uh, the water is going uh, up the, the side of the vessel, while in another universe uh, the water stays flat? I think the only way to argue, uh, to argue um, for a difference between these two states is by introducing something like absolute space. So I believe that Kant's idea is a little bit insufficient. What is your idea on, on I that? I agree with you on that. I mean, he can't really get what he's aiming for there. I mean, that's the problem with relationism in general. Relationism, as, as Pyramid called it, it's the bed and glory of all uh, rotations, the, is, the, is always the, the main obstacle to constructing relationism. And, even, and that's true even today for the work of like Barber and Batati. They have to come up with these action principles and stuff, and they basically have to postulate that the angular momentum of the universe is zero to get to re, to recapture Newtonian physics. That may be true, but that's just a, but that isn't guaranteed, right? I mean, it seems like the universe isn't rotating, but that's this just maybe a contingent fact. So rotation has always been the problem. So I agree with you. He can't get what he's doing. It just doesn't work that way, uh, and so it's a big obstacle. And, and but it's a big obstacle for all relations. It's a big obstacle for Berkeley, obviously, for Huygens. And, uh, and for um, Leibniz as well. In terms of the first part, here's where we will have a good discussion next week. That claim about God not being everywhere but acting everywhere, that's Leibniz. And that comes, and this is the stuff I've been actually publishing on recently. And so Euler says the same thing, but I really think that that idea that God is not in space, this comes out a lot in the new essays, it comes out a lot in the Leibniz Clark correspondence, and of course, he, uh, uh, Kant read, uh, is, uh, reads the new essays in the 1760s, but of course he's aware of the Leibniz Club correspondence long before that. But uh, that's one thing. You see, I, here's where you have to kind of know some of the other stuff I'm arguing. I don't think that the conception of space you get in Leibniz, I mean, the, people tend to take Article 47 of, of, the, of the fifth letter that Leibniz writes as giving you this kind of empirical notion that space is a relation amongst bodies. I really think that that's, that's not correct. I think he's basically saying this is how we come to know about similar places. But he clearly says, right, in, 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 the, in the essays and a bunch of other works, that space is a fixed set of, of geometric properties. And he says in the new essays and elsewhere that, that, um, that uh, and this is kind of getting to the nominal stuff we were talking about a few days ago, that, that there's, no, there's not two spaces, the space of, of material objects in an infinite, in, 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 a, in, a, in a sort of space that exists over and above it. So he's, he's taking that nominalist line. I think a lot of Leibniz's uh, statements about space is, is consistent with, with nominalism, that there is a fixed sort of geometric structure in the world, and it's, he says, secured by God's existence. And, and, but that, doesn't exi that, that only exists when there's matter that exists. And, and he even says in an extremely non-relational line, he says that 
that the, the fixed structure of spatial relations determines how the bodies are relative to one another. He says it's like tiles laid out in a grid. There's only so many spaces for bodies. And so if you say that space determines the relationships of bodies, that kicks you out of relationism, right? Because relationism is the view that it's the relationships of bodies that determine the geometrical distance relations, not the other way around. So many of the things that Leibniz says are much on closer to the Newtonian side. And, and the other one, the most, we were talking about this, I think, earlier today, is this concept that he whips out in the USA is called universal place. And he says universal place is a geometric sort of structure that records all changes of body's positions uh, and, and keeps a memory of them. And so that relative to universal place, all bodies can be mapped as to where they went and where, they, you know, where they're going. That is absolutism. And, and he says that uh, hand in hand with his rejection of space being an entity. The only way I, you can make sense of that is by saying he's talking about nominalism, that there is a sense in which there's sort of a fixed geometric structure of the world, but that thing only exists when matter exists. And so I, I really, I mean, this is my thing, obviously for me it would be very controversial, but I actually think that the best way to understand Leibniz is a nominalist. He's kind of, a, he's kind of an absolute nominalist, whereas I think uh, Newton is an, is an absolute Platon, Platonist. Right, because because, uh, because Newton thinks that that these fixed places exist even if no matter exists. But of course, for both of them, it's ultimately grounded in God, right? And so, uh, in, in fact, Leibniz often says that the truths of geometry are fixed, and they're fixed by God, right? And that and that all all the the, the structure of, of geometric structure uh, um, is 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 a truth grounded in God's existence. And of course, that's very similar to. And if you look at the things he says, it's very similar, like to the to the imaginary space conception. He seems to think that there's a sense in which we can talk about space, right, as this geometric structure, but it really doesn't exist until there's matter out there. And that's very similar, I think, to the old imaginary space conception. That, like I said, imaginary space always kind of plays this dual role as being a bit absolutist and a bit relationist. It's a bit absolutist because we can talk about the, the, the world moving through it, or I mean, and guys like that uh, even talk that way, right? That, 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 that we can talk about meaningfully uh, a shift in the entire world through, through space. Uh, and that's what imaginary space allowed for you to talk about. You, know, you can get out of the heretical, you can get out of the heretical implications. Um, and this is part of the 1277 condemnation, right? God could move the world if God wanted to. Imaginary space is a way to try to, to allow that to be the case because we could say that the, the world would move. But it's relationist in the sense that until the world moves into that imaginary space, there are no geometric relations there. They only come to existence when a body gets there. And so I think Leibniz is really, his conception of, of space is a lot more like an imaginary space conception. But imaginary space, space conception has a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of absolutism to it. And, 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 the, the, and we'll talk about this next week. But that idea that, that, um, that uh, God isn't in the world, only God's actions in the world, right? That's what we were talking about earlier this week. That's repeated with Bay, right? That's that God is not situated in space, but only God's actions are. So, I mean, people give an Eulerian spin on it. I think it's really a lot of So I have a real, so I, I disagree with the real on that. Uh, so, but um, for, uh, you're right that Newton is a Platonist. Yeah. But if you skip the transcendental idealism from Kant's transcendental aesthetics, I believe that his, uh, what he presents us is actually a Newtonian space. Even if, if, you, if you skip the transcendental idealism, so the arguments he gives in the, the metaphysical exposition, the four arguments, are very, very Newtonian to my mind. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you lay them side by side to, with the gravitation, a text of course, you, uh, Kant did not know, the arguments seem to be very, very similar. And so on the one, one hand, he has this idea of, of a kind of uh, platonic, we have an immediate idea of, the absence of, an, of a space spreading into infinity. It's not something that you can achieve by, by, by empiricism, for instance. And in the metaphysical foundations of natural science, you say that he is a relationalist. Of course, he's to some degree, to, to some degree but of, he still introduces absolute space. Absolute space as a necessary, necessary idea of reason. Yeah, but it's a necessary idea for constructing relevant spaces. To me, that's just a sleight of hand by him. Yes. He's being a relationist and he's trying to appropriate Newtonian terminology. I, I, so I, you know. So. But it's but a regulative idea. It's of course, he says it's not constitutive, of course, but uh, he, still need, he still needs it. It's necessary to give, to give um, the relative space um, the right um, 
right order to each other. I, I'll agree with you on this. I think he wants to get uh, this kind of fixed sort of space that that we could think of as as being the backdrop, right? Mm -hmm. But but he does it through this construction of these relative spaces. It's kind of like it's kind of like I, I, in, the, in, the, in the article I, I'm working on this. I really compare it almost to like modal relations. And the modal relationist basically says that given an object, there's there's um, uh, we can talk about possible bodies. And I think that's exactly what, what Kant's doing. He's talking about possible bodies, possible further extensions of the universe to another bigger relative space. So I mean, I think it's kind of a terminological distinction. I mean, I mean, essentially what modal relationists do, it's kind of a sleight of hand too, is that they want to regain Newtonian fixed space, but they want to get it from a body-centered perspective. And that seems to be what Kant's trying to do but, too. But this, this kind of, of uh of extension of research, extension of, of the of the bodies we are we are, we are looking at, is still led by, by the idea of absolute space, and for that reason it's necessary, even though it has, it has a, a different meaning right. to Kant, and absolute um, absolute space is is, is is still a very important uh, role in. in but, but, like think, but like think of Leibniz, right? There's a universal place that records the motions of all bodies in relative to universal, universal place. We can sort of map the previous motions of bodies. That's absolute space too, as we see it as a Newtonian. That's why I say when you, when you really push these guys, there's oftentimes not a lot of difference between them. I mean, uh, I, I agree with your point. It's just that I think we get hung up by this Newtonian. We, we have this sort of preconceived notion of what absolute space and what, and what relational space are. Uh, and and, uh, and oftentimes we can we, we, we tend to side with this notion that um, that you can't talk about say fixed geometric truths and stuff uh, uh, if you're if you're a relationist. But a, but a, but at least amongst uh, Leibniz, right? And um, and, and uh, um, certainly not amongst Huygens and, 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 and later people, right? It seems like that's not really what's going on. They they're really talking about about space very much the way Newton did. But when, and so therefore when they reject space. Uh, as being a, uh, when they talk about when they reject absolutism, what I really think they're talking they're rejecting is a Platonic conception that space exists apart from bodies. Uh, you know, so those fixed geometric truths are there, but they have to be grounded in matter in some sense uh, uh, to to come alive, right? Where, but but the, but like I said, Leibniz often says that the truths of geometry are grounded in God, they're not really grounded in matter. The truths are there, and matter instantiates those truths. So I, you know, but anyways, I, I I sort of agree that he's trying to recapture. Sort of the original Newtonian conception, but he seems to be doing it through bodies and and these relative spaces, and so I see that as is really quite drastically different than what Newton was doing, you know, because Newton basically says right that uh, uh, space exists even if there were no bodies, right, and that uh, and that you know mathematical space, mathematical time, right, have their own existence. Of course, you know, there then it's not totally different from 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 um, from Leibniz either, because Newton clearly thinks that space is a property of God. And, and if you were to ask Newton, um, put, put it this way, what's the contradiction? Is there any thinkers in the history of, of thinking about space and time that said that space exists absent everything, that it's really an entity and that nothing has to ground it? And the answer is almost nobody has ever held that view. Maybe you go back to the ancient atomists, maybe guys like Lucippus and Democritus and, and, and Epicurus, uh, and when they talk about the void, they may be seeming to think that there's a fixed spatial geometry out there which it can exist by itself and doesn't have to be grounded in any deeper entity. But it's so. But that view is so rare. The idea that space is its own entity, right, that isn't grounded in something pri 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 uh, prior and something at a, at a more basic ontological level. Um, because, like I said, Newton would reject that too. I mean, if you ask Newton, like, um, could space exist by itself without God? I'm sure he would say no. You know, and so, so it's like, what ground space? It's a God for Newton. It's God plus matter for Leibniz. I mean, there really isn't a whole lot of difference amongst these guys. I mean, they're very similar, I think. Um, I, I think we tend to get, I think we tend to, uh, well, let's put it this way. We, there, there, there's two forms of relationism, right? There's the fully consistent Huygensian version, which I think is modern relationism. And then you have this kind of quasi-absolutism that you get in Leibniz, right? Where it's kind of a hybrid of God and matter as opposed to all God for Newton. And so really, in many ways, Newton and Leibniz are much closer than they are to, to Huygens. Now, where does relational motion come in for Leibniz? It's a perceived thing. I really think that he sees it as a perceptual quality of objects, that the, uh, the phenomenal world will always hold up relational motion. I think Kant, of course, accepts that too. So, so, so our empirical understanding of the world uh, is kind of relational, but the, found the metaphysical foundation seems to be more absolute. I don't know if I'm, if I'm answering any 
asking her opinion. But, but, but I, I, you know, I agree with your, I, I, I agree with your points. But as I say, I, I really think that what New, what Kant is doing is he's trying to give a spin on Newtonian conception of absolute space via uh, a, a relational story. Because boy, he buys into so many of the things that Huygens and Barclay and uh, and uh, and, uh, um, and the Leibniz buy into in some sense that. Uh, motion can only can only be a relative thing. There's so many similarities between the things that Kant says in the metaphysical foundations, as I was showing you, and the things that Barclay says, and the, and the things that that uh, um, that uh, Huygens said. That it's just it's just to me it's just uh, it's it's astounding, right? Uh, um, that when you read it, you're like, wow, you know, this guy really is falling in that tradition. But the good, but the interesting question is, is how much did he really know of that? Well, he, he must have known to a certain extent because you know he was a Leibnizian Wolfian for a long time, so he must have been exposed to a lot of their work. But how he came about it, how he knew about it, how he knew about the center of mass reference frame for collisions and all the rest of that, that I don't know. And I'm not quite sure about that. Oh, can you just, of course, just a bit switching to speak up? I was waiting um, to ask a question. There would be one argument against this idea that Kant gets closer to, gets closer to Leibniz in the metaphysical foundation. Um, the fact that he, um, compared to the physical methodology, uh, in the metaphysical foundations, he abandons this idea of the smallest uh, parts of matter, mm -hmm. of physical monad, um, which he uh, asserted in the physical methodology, and which were um, more Vulcan, maybe, mm -hmm. than Leibniz, because they, had, they already had external relationships, and they, were, they sounded more like Wolves. Oh, so Kant. they are Kant's, yes, Kant's uh, physical monads in the physical monadology, and so they are abandoned in the physical, mm -hmm. like the physical foundation. So this would be, this would go in Friedman's direction that he is closer to Newton. Um, this would be one, uh, one remark. Uh, and the second, concerning Euler and Leibniz, um, I have the feeling that. Um, and Euler and the uh, Maupertuis and the general the sciences at the, the um, Academy of Berlin were much closer to Leibniz than they um, said. In fact, even when they criticized Leibniz, they tacitly they had Leibnizian uh, uh, ideas and doctrines, uh, even when they went for Newton. So it, it was kind of a, a synthesis, not even official, but Leibniz was very much present. So Kant could have known he was very aware of their writings and mm -hmm. read a lot. So he knew that very well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's true. I mean, I think, I think a lot of people there were espousing those views. Um, in terms of the first part, um, a lot of people have been writing on this too. Watkins and people have written on this. Um, uh, Don Rutherford actually wrote a really interesting paper on this too. Li uh, I think Kant is much more consistently a Leibnizian than he is a Wolfian. Um, his teacher, Newton, actually even says that in some sense the relations amongst the simple substances which is the basis of space. Uh, I think a lot of the criticisms of what he calls the Leibnizian Wolfians that he brings up in the critique and elsewhere are really criticisms of the Wolfians, not of Leibniz. In fact, if anything, I think Kant is the most consistent Leibnizian. And the reason is, is that he specifically says, and he's very specific on that, uh, he's, very, he's very determined on this, that his monads are not in space. That space is a result of the monads, and that's exactly what Leibniz told. In fact, I mean, in fact, Rutherford even says that, that, that there's nobody who's more consistent to Leibniz than, than Kant. Um, and but he, then he, and he and, What's that? In the 80s, he says that matter is divisible. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, in that sense, um, but you know, there's a long story about that, too, because in the physical monadology, he tries to give a story about how you can't cut the, the force of action that emanates from his monads. He tries to get this story about divisibility. He worries about this divisibility of space thing. It's a big part in, in, in his later uh, physical monadology, his, his, his later work on, on the monadology. Um, and so clearly in the, in the critique, right, in the critical period, he's not playing with the monads anymore, right? But I think, you know, he's giving this different story. He, he gives the forms of intuition of space. He generates this whole sort of transcendental idealist, which is kind of partially empiricist conception. Uh, and, and that's just not playing a role anymore. But, you know, and we were having this conversation, I think, uh, uh, yesterday or this morning. Um, in the Opus Postumum, right, he starts talking that way again. And he starts, and he starts now giving a version of what earlier was monads. Now he starts talking about an ethic. So, and, and so I think that, you know, I, my, my, my position is that, that Kant is a Leibnizian. 
<laughs> and I think he was a full, I, I think in the critical period, or at least in those major tracks, he's just not talking about that stuff anymore. He's giving you a different conception because he starts playing again with an ether or some kind of underlying thing which is force-based in some way or has caloric or, 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 or some kind of other force. And I think he's always attracted to that. To me, that's the numinal world for Khan, I think, is the world of monads in the critical period. I really, I think he's a Leibnizian. I mean, I think, <laughs> I don't think Khan's a Kantian. <laughs> in a weird way. So I, you know, so I think that, um, I think that he's giving an empirical uh, gloss on his earlier physical monadology in the critical period, but he's never really rejected that view. He's just giving a different take on it, an empirically oriented take on it. I know this is extremely heretical, but I mean, he starts talking that way again in the Opus Posturum. Doesn't that suggest that he never gave up on those views? But uh, in his lessons, I, I wondered, I was very astonished when I saw that, in his lessons, even in the late ones, in the 90s, uh, he still talks about space as a zone of God. Yeah, so yeah. As if he let right. Him and he that comes up in Alpha's Postulum again. Yeah. Right. 70, right. 1770, yeah. so he had this double view of space. Yeah. Yeah, and he starts talking about God again in his classroom as well, you know. But also in the uh, physical monadology, God is what ties the monads together. It's the act, the actions of the. I mean, like I said, so once again, of course, that's exactly what Leibniz says, right? Leibniz says that in some sense, God is that that the only connection of the monads is with God. And so, I mean, so I mean, I, I think, like I said, I I, I agree with, with Rutherford on this, right? I think. Kant was really, I think Kant came to realize that the Wolfians were, were mis, mischaracterizing Leibniz, and that he thought that there's something wrong about this notion that space is the relations amongst the monads. That's not true. It's the force that emanates from the monads somehow connects at a higher level of reality to form space. And he says that actually in the physical monadology, that space in some sense is, is sort of like a consequence of the monadic activity, but the monads themselves are not in space. And of course, that's exactly what Leibniz says. I mean, it's really fascinating when you read some of those earlier uh, works. I mean, he really knew his Leibniz, you know, and I think he came to realize that the Wolfian tradition that he was raised in was, was kind of was getting it wrong, you know, that they were essentially conflating Article 47 of the Leibniz Clark correspondence with the monadology. Uh, and, and I think he came to see that that was wrong, that, that you know, you, you, you can't, you know, like I said, there's, there's a tendency to read Leibniz as being, basically being like Barclay, right? That space is a relation amongst objects that we, that we abstract from bodies. Leibniz never says that view. Leibniz would re reject that view. Why? Because space is grounded on God, and geometric properties are fixed, such that geometric properties determine how bodies exist and where they exist. And of course, that's very absolutist, you know? And so, like I said, I, I, in my work, which, you know, like I said, it would consider it extremely heretical, uh, I think that we've, I think not only have we gotten Kant wrong, we've, we've seriously gotten Leibniz wrong too. Um, I, I really think that, 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 uh, that he doesn't fit the sort of standard view that we, we give to him. But, it, but the, the stuff you're bringing up about God and everything that comes up later on, right, all that stuff's in Leibniz too. Right? You know, Leibniz says that, that God is the ultimate foundation of space uh, and that, um, and that uh, God grounds the truths of space. But matter instantiates those truths, and that's not what Whereas God directly instantiates space for Newton, right? You know, and so and so. In fact, even in the determined finest of extension view, which we'll be talking about tomorrow morning, right? It's a sense in which all there exists is God and God's extension, and all of us are like little, like spinozistic sort of properties floating around in the big, in the big God extension, you know. Um, and so there you have essentially the same view of Newton and Leibniz. Only different entities are, are. There's a different story about the grounding to the, the level of space. So uh, you said that in the idea that the connection between the substances is, is, um, is, is made by God is a Leibnizian idea. I always believe that it's more a Newtonian idea in the sense that he makes a reference um, to the letter uh, um, to, to, to the boy, about the boiler just to Bentley. Because um, there um, Newton discusses how is it possible that two entities are uh, acting th through empty space. And he says, of course, I don't wish that you call me someone who believes in action at a distance. There must be some kind of medium. It's either material or immaterial. Of course, it cannot be material because right. then gravity would yeah. act again on this on, on this, this medium. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, it's very plausible. And Friedman and other uh, other uh, interpreters uh, stress this. And it's very plausible that he thinks of the omnipresent God as the medium that yeah. acts Absolutely. Uh, yeah. by that. Um, gravity acts through empty space, right. and what 
I believe what, what Kant does in, in his pre-critical writing when he says, okay, space is constituted by the action of the, of the substance, of the substances, and in, the, in his later, I think in the 50s, you know, something like that, that it's, the substances are connected through the mind of God. Yeah. Then yeah. he takes this idea, this, this Newtonian idea, that gravity is actually constituted by God himself and applies it to this more Leibnizian, uh, Leibnizian uh, conception of space. So it's again a synthesis. Yeah. But I, I don't think it's a Leibnizian idea that the substances are acting on each other um, um, Oh, through, through through a force. It, 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 it's a Newtonian idea yeah. that he took from the letter to uh, um, um, to Bentley, and you can see the arguments like that also from in the um, in the optics mm -hmm. and in in the Leibniz Clark correspondence. Yeah, no, I would agree with you on that on that specific thing of what's causing gravity in the letters to Bentley and elsewhere, um, and, it, and, and even in the optics and the queries of the optics where he says you know where he uses the God sensorium thing. Mm -hmm. um, it, I think clearly. Uh, Leibniz would reject that, right? Because Leibniz rejects gravity, and he's, he wants to give a, a Cartesian sort of mechanistic account of it ultimately. But the thing that you would, I think, you would find really fascinating here, if you looked at it, is, is um, look at um, um, Rick Arthur's book, *The Labyrinth of the Continuum*. Uh, I wrote about this in an article uh, about five or six years ago. Uh, this concept called the immensum that Leibniz toys with in the, in the 1670s. Essentially, Leibniz starts off with this view where essentially it's, it's, it's almost exactly the term in quantities of extension. Of view that you get in the De Gravitationi. He talks about space, about, about objects being, in some sense, coming out of God, that God is kind of like this, it's almost like God's the sensorium, God is the ultimate place, and all things exist within God and come out of it. It's a very Spinozistic view. And, and, he, and, he, and he takes that view and he keeps tweaking it and tweaking it, and God's sort of presence there gets less and less and less and less. But, it, but you would be amazed how close it is to, uh, uh, to the things that come, that, that, that says it in the De Gravitationi. So, like I said, I, I really think Newton and Leibniz are not really much, much closer than people have thought, especially on the God and grounding stuff. But on gravity, I agree with you. He, he clearly would not accept the kind of story you get in the letters of Bentley of Newton, where, 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 uh, where God may actually be the cause of gravity itself. I mean, Newton seems to almost be suggesting that God is actually giving the oomph of bodies. And clearly, Leibniz would reject that. Mm. Yeah, that, that that's clearly the case. So, I, I would agree on that. In that respect, Kant goes even further than you do. Know. He asserts that there is a, this immediate, uh, um, I don't know, operation or attraction to an empty space. So yeah, yeah, I mean. Um, yeah, I mean, but you know, but Newton himself is kind of, you know, Newton's torn by this, right? I mean, because he keeps wanting to toy with other theories himself. And, uh, and, and I, I think Newton um, himself is really bugged by this gravity thing. And, it, and he seems to sense, he seems to suggest that God may be doing it. But then he seems to be still kind of wanted to play with ether conception. So I think Newton really was kind of torn about, about how he wanted to approach gravity. I mean, the cause of gravity was one of his great, I think, concerns. And, and, he, and, I, and, 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 uh, and, and I think these are all just suggestions he played with. Whether, you know, it, it may be that he, he was really siding with God. You know, like I was mentioning that in, in um, uh, uh, earlier that, that uh, in one of the discussions we've had over the last couple of days, that um, what we know from people who hung out with Newton is that that determined quantities of extension hypothesis that God, you know, that God is literally diffused through space and that God, and that we're all sort of like in God's space. He seems, uh, people commented that Newton held that until the very end, calm to the guy who, uh, uh, who have helped to edit, edit one of the later versions of Locke's essays, says he had a conversation with Newton and he reports exactly that, that he really, he says, this guy really thinks that God is in space. And, and so did Gregory, David Gregory said the same thing. And so, so that, that view, he seems to have held all the way to the end, right, to his life. Um, but whether or not, um, whether or not, but how gravity operates, I think he wanted a mechanical explanation, but he just couldn't get it to work. He wanted to have a mechanical ether, but he just couldn't get the details right. And so God was always there to, to be his to be his go to, right, to, to resolve the problem of gravity. But um, um, yeah, so but I mean, but clearly, right, this is one aspect where there's a huge difference between Newton and Leibniz, right? Uh, Leibniz would never accept that gravity is, is that way. He's he's gonna try to give some kind of vortex explanation for, for gravity, just the way Descartes tried to do it, and many of the Cartesians tried to do, right? And so he's gonna try to give a purely mechanistic account of contact mechanical explanation of gravity, whereas 
I said, Newton is toying with that, but he just can't get, get it to work, so he seems to want to reject that. But, uh, right. um, I'm not sure the, which, which one? Uh, the test for relations. Oh, yeah, yeah. Maybe the one body universe. Right, the one body universe, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he says that in one slide. I don't know if I can get it back, but he basically. The first law that the third law? Yeah, uh, I had it in one of those quotes up there. I don't know if I can get it up here anymore. But he, he, he says in the, in the Metaphysical Foundations, oh, yeah, this thing's all played. It'll take forever to get this up again. But he says in the Metaphysical Foundations and elsewhere that motion is a relation and, and, and therefore it can only be relative to bodies. And so, so the suggestion is there is that a, a, a universe with one body, uh, you can't talk about motion with respect to it. So at least in certain claims, uh, um, Kant seems to pass the limits test of relations and that a lone body you can't talk about states of motion or you know. And so that's very strong, like I said. Uh, um, and like I said, the th relationism is really complex because I've been talking about this Leibnizian story about how close Leibniz's conception of space is in an absolute sense to Newton's. But of course, when it comes to motion, Leibniz is relationist, right? He, he sees that all our experience of motion will always be reciprocal. It will always uphold, in some sense, um, um, uh, the equivalence of hypothesis, as he calls it. And so there's a weird sense in which there's a bifurcation from the way he, perceives, he, he thinks we will always experience motion to the kind of absolute story he gives about space. And so it's really complex in Leibniz. And, and, that's, and that's, I think, the eclecticism of Leibniz, right? He, he, he likes a lot of the stuff I think that he toyed with earlier, that meant some concept that God is sort of the foundation of space. He never really gives up on that. But I think he, he really, but he's, he's won over by Huygens' relational construction of the, of the laws of mechanics. And he thinks that that has to be true too. And so trying to bring all these things together to a consistent picture of mind is really, really difficult because uh, he seems to want to think that they're both going on. And that's why part of the reason why I actually think that like, there's a sense in which you can see Kant is, is, is doing something very similar because, um, but I think he's doing it more consistently like in the metaphysical foundations because there he's really trying to talk about absolute space as a, this construction process of relational spaces that goes on to infinity. And, 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 uh, and, and Leibniz never said anything like that at all. And, and, and in fact, Kant's story about this absolute space being this construction of relative space concepts, like I said, that's really modern because that's the way modal relations talk, right? Uh, given the existence of one space, we can construct in some sense through abstraction or, or by iteration. We can get, keep thinking of space in some sense being generated more and more and more. Um, and, and, and therefore, we can try to recapture an Newtonian space. Uh, but it's all supposedly done relationally because it's all based on, on, on one existing real body or one existing real relative space. You know? um, but um, yeah, um, yeah, I guess right, yeah. So he, he, he does pass the limits test there, at least in, in certain claims anyways. Um, so I have a very general question and pretty much from the outside of the whole country. But um, my view of it is that the, the, the story with the importance of Newton's physics for, for Kant is gives also a pretty coherent picture of what Kant is trying to do in, in, in his project and the, the sort of relation he points to to um, Build as an uh, science to you know, physics. And um, if you, if you, does your project affect in any way? Does, does it have an, an impact? How, how do we think of, of the relation between, between science and, and physics in Kant or epistemology or whatever if he's um, in balance? Right. Oh, the, the relationship between science and metaphysics. If from the uh, Dissol um, um, thesis you drop the B entirely and you just have he's engaging with the term physics because it is the, the, the success of it, yeah. Yeah, um, does that change in any way? Uh, as he goes on, or, or in, in the group? Is it changed? Yeah, from in, the, in the critical phase. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, I think he, he wants to. Um, my take on it, uh, you know, we have, so I guess the question is, what's the relationship between science and metaphysics in the critical mm -hmm. period, right? And and, uh, and and how does Newton impact that? Um, okay, I mean, there is a story yeah. of how Newton impacts that, but right. adding adding Leibniz in, does, does that change the story? Or oh, adding Leibniz into the story? Uh, 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 yeah. You know, your your twist of it would that change the? Well, I, uh, I think that, you know, like I said, I think he's kind of a Leibnizian. He has Leibnizian tendencies his whole career. I. I you know, if, if I'm if I'm if I'm thinking about how to answer it right, I would say that um, he he 
he does, I mean, this is, and this is a story that, you know, we've been talking about a little bit earlier. Um, he, he tends to think that the, in, the, in the regions of space, he criticizes the, the relationists, the Wolfians, uh, by saying that, that um, you can't get the unity of space, you can't get in some sense the, the infinity of space from experience, right? And that's obviously a big part of the critique, that we do not derive the idea of space from bodies. Of course, I think Leibniz would agree with that exactly. Why? Because the truths of space are grounded in God, they're not grounded in material bodies. So Leibniz would have no problem with that. Um, and, and I think, and, that, and so he's, I think he's thinking that some of the Wolfians maybe were starting, were starting to toy with that view. But um, so, so clearly, in the critical period, he realizes that maybe some of the silly sort of interpretations of, of the Leibniz in tradition that maybe Newton and some of the other ones were given, namely that space is a relation amongst monads that this is just not right, and that you can't derive space empirically, uh, and therefore it has to be an intuition, it has to be in our mind. But remember the conversation we were having earlier, um, uh, if you take the interpretation of Leibniz, which I think is the correct interpretation that Rutherford and, and, and Arthur and Garber, I think, sort of hold to a certain extent, that all that exists for Leibniz is force, and that we project geometry onto the world, and the geometric properties of bodies their size, motion, along with all the color, are contributions we provide to the world. Isn't that what most people interpret Kant as? Like I said, I really, I mean, I, I, I interpret Leibniz as kind of like through that kind of Kantian lens. That the, but the difference is, is that in the critical period for Kant, he doesn't want to talk about what the numinal world is. Whereas Leibniz has a view of what the numinal world is. It's a world of force. But they're very, very similar. I think they're very, very similar. Um, um, they, Geometric properties are things that are built into us, I and mean, that's how we understand the world. Kant, in the critical period, wants to say that the numinal world is forever out, you know, is never obtainable. We can only know it through the forms of intuition and the categories, and blah, 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 right? And so this is the way we grasp the world. But we can't talk about the numinal world. Leibniz basically says, right, that, you know, he, he rejects, this. interestingly enough, he rejects the primary secondary property distinction. He says, you know, all these, these thinkers, the, all these metaphysicians, these, these, these Macbethanists think that, that color and stuff doesn't exist in the, in the world, but geometry does. And he goes, ah, but I think geometry is pretty ideal, too. It's, it's a contribution we provide. And so, so, so maybe, the, maybe, the reason, maybe the reason why I think that Kant and Leibniz are so close is not because I'm, 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 I'm interpreting a Kant that much differently. That's because I interpret Leibniz much differently, you know. And so, so the, I think they're really very, I think, like I said, I think Kant was like the last consistent Leibnizian. And I, and I think that, that in many ways Kant was like, it reached the heights of what you can do with Leibniz's thought. And so I, I think that obviously that's extremely heretical to a whole Kant view. But I have some big people backing me up too, like Rutherford and Arthur and a bunch of people, because they're kind of siding with that position as well.